How has your understanding of and approach towards minimalism developed over the last seven years? I think my approach has probably changed the same way many people's approach changes. Mm. Ryan and I will often say that minimalism starts with the stuff. And so for me, it truly started with the stuff. You can call it decluttering. You can call it letting go, tidying up. There are all kinds of monikers we can give it. Mm. But it was really about, it was a reaction to being overwhelmed by stuff. Yeah. I had too much stuff in my life. But it turns out that our material possessions are a physical manifestation of what's going on inside us. I knew I had a lot of external clutter. What I didn't know was I had a lot of social clutter, relationship clutter, career clutter, Mm -hmm. psychological clutter, emotional clutter, spiritual clutter, calendar clutter, obligation clutter. There's a lot of internal, mental, and emotional clutter going on inside me. And as soon as I started letting go, I... I started looking inward and and realizing like, oh my gosh, there is so much that I still need to deal with. And and at first, when you start to understand the truth about your stuff and your relationship with stuff, Mm. it causes actually more turmoil Mm. because it's like, oh, I thought things were fine and maybe I was just one solution away from solving all of my problems. Mm. But then I realized, no, 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 no. There are actually more problems, and I was covering them up. You know, I, I think about my mom when, when she died, because that's how we kind of started the whole minimalist thing. When, when she died, I started questioning everything. She died of stage four lung cancer. Mm. Had she caught that cancer earlier, stage one, she may have been able to eradicate it, right? But mm. instead, we wait, we wait, we wait until it has metastasized all over our lives Mm. and and i felt like i just had this sort of metastasy of of clutter throughout every area of my life and why why do we do that well i did it because i wanted to be accepted i wanted to be successful i wanted to be better i wanted to be improved i wanted to be the best version of myself or whatever that that meant but it was all by someone else's standards. If I buy the right thing, have the right relationship, have the right job, live in the right house, own the right car, then I will be the right person. Mm. But of course, it never worked. In fact, it took me so far away from being the person I wanted to be. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the uh, metastasizing comment makes me think about how you know often people will ask, well, do you have to have like a major life event happen to like be inspired to be a minimalist. And unfortunately, I think that's probably how most people start down this road Mm -hmm. is because they wait and wait and wait and keep putting things off until you get to a boiling point. It's almost like um, someone who's in a job that they really hate. They're like, should I quit my job right now? Because it's like, well, no, you should have quit it like a year ago, but, but a year prior to that year, you should have planned an exit. And like, now you're at this point where like, you feel like you have to do something radical. Mm. Um, and I'll, you know, for me, and I definitely felt like I had to do something radical where I was in my life. So minimalism, it was like radical enough, not because, not for any other reason than I needed to change my state. I needed a different perspective on how I was approaching my life. So that's what I saw minimalism as an opportunity. Now this question asks over the last 11 years, mm-hmm. but technically it's been, you've been doing this for about 12 oh, plus years. Right. Yeah, and you've been doing it for over 11. What's what's fascinating is this year, 2021, mm. is our 30th anniversary, Ryan. You and I have known <laughs> each other since 1991. Yeah, that's wild, man. And we've been great friends. And on the Maximal episode this week, I actually want to go back to our childhood and Heck talk yeah. a little bit about how we, the narrative overlay is Ryan and I have been best friends since we were fat little fifth graders. Mm. And while that's partially true, it's not the whole story. And we've had times in our lives where we've grown apart and we've come back together. Mm. And so I want to talk to you about a lot of that. Yeah. You use this word radical. And what's so fascinating about it is you're right. Minimalism does seem so radical to certain people, but the reason it does is because we've been doing all of these radical things. Yeah. We've been steeped. In radness, <laughs> <laughs> radicalness. Yeah, and, and yeah. We, we've had so you know having three hundred thousand items in your home was it? That's normal. It's What's normal average? now. Yeah, that's what we mean. What, what I mean by normal. Yeah. Right. It's it's average. It's mm-hmm. the norm. Right. Yeah. And yet, if you look 
a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. Mm. That's so radical and unheard of. Kings didn't have three hundred thousand items in their home. Dude, Native Americans thought it was a uh, a mental illness. Mm -hmm. It is. Yes. Really. I mean, so we are like the level of hoarding we have now. It's an acceptable level of hoarding because it's average. Yes. But you're right. A thousand years ago, they would have looked at us like, why are you holding on to so much stuff? Right. And you and your possessions and the me, the mine, I'm not against having personal possessions. Obviously, I have plenty of them, but I do have a problem with the clinging. Mm. And we, qu we quite often cling with the, oh, that's mine. Mm. In fact, we see it manifest in mental illness. There's a guy across the street this, this morning, you and I Ooh. saw him. Yeah. He, uh, he's been living literally across the street from the studio here. And yeah. he is, I mean, he's a traditionally mentally ill hoarder. Poor guy. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I feel so bad for him, but there's a guy who bought the building across the street and he even offered him money and try to help him out, get out of here. Can I yeah. get you housing? Like, is there something I can do here? Yeah. And the guy has simply refused, but he has, I mean, I feel like he has 300,000 items across the street. You can't even walk down the sidewalk where he is anymore. And you know, it's, that's a great observation because people will often ask like, well, how does, how does a homeless person use minimalism in their life? And I agree. Like, there, there are different um, people are on a different socioeconomic scale. My problems are different from a homeless person's problems. Right. But using that person as an example, um, he, he was he's in such a scarcity mindset that he holds on to every single thing. That's right. Which actually ends up being a detriment to him. Yeah. In fact, you and I grew up really poor. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we, we hear people all the time say, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm poor. That means I'm a minimalist, right? I was like, well, no, we, we definitely weren't minimalists when we were growing up. And by the way, you're American poor, which is way different than poor poor. <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's a stat for you. Do you make $32,000 or more? If so, you're in the top 1% of people in the world. Yeah, that's crazy. You, you're a one percenter, right? That's 16 bucks an hour, by the way. <laughs> and, and so like, it, what's fascinating is we can get out of poverty, mm -hmm. but we often don't get out of the poverty mindset. Yeah. And that's where Ryan and I were. We still had a scarcity mindset. We left behind where we grew up. We climbed the corporate ladder. We spent, here's the weird thing, Ryan, next year will be 12 years for us. Yeah. I spent 12, and so it's 12 years for me right now, uh, minimalism, since I discovered minimalism and it came into my life. And I didn't discover it, by the way. Like, I mean, I discovered it the way, same way Christopher Columbus discovered America. Right, or like, Ben Franklin discovered electricity. Yes, yeah. it, like minimalism was already there. I happened to you, stumble you, into it. You uncovered it. Yes, I uncovered it for me. Anyway, it's been 12 years for me since I, I simplified my life, a little bit over 12 years mm. at this point. So it was, what was that, 2009 when my mom died. And my marriage ended both in, in the same year, in the same month yeah. that year. And I started looking around and I realized like, oh, I'd spent the last 12 years in the corporate world climbing the corporate ladder, but I still had that scarcity mindset. Yeah, I was still clinging, grasping. Now I was clinging to different things and, and I was told that they were better things, mm. but they weren't better. They were societally acceptable clinging. Yeah. I was holding on to status, achievement, success, et cetera. And there's nothing wrong with those things as a byproduct. But mm. if I think they're going to make me happy, fulfilled, complete, it's just another form of consumerism. Yeah. And even when walking away from that world and becoming the minimalist, I've seen times where it's like, oh, yeah, and here's the right way to be successful. Mm. Well, that can also turn into another form of consumerism. Yeah. And so here's the main lesson that I've learned. Yeah. I was is, just going to ask you, like if you had to highlight it, all, your understandings, how, how they've changed. Consumerism extends well beyond the stuff. Ooh, yeah, for so sure. Consumerism is the ideology that buying things is going to make me happy or complete. Mm. But we often shift that. Well, I'll get rid of my things and now I'm going to be a consumer of experiences. Mm. Experiences are great. I really enjoy them. In fact, the one way to be present is to experience life. However, if we start chasing experiences, if I just had this experience, then I would be happy. If I just had this experience, then I'd be fulfilled. If I had this experience, it would be better than owning stuff. Well, maybe, but maybe it's also a chase. And so any yeah. chase often takes away my freedom. 
And I value freedom. I value peace. I value tranquility in a way that I didn't value it in my 20s. And it's not good. It's not that you should value peace. It's just, I would say that I wanted freedom. Mm. I would say that I wanted peace. But then my actions would be everything that took me out of peace, mm. added chaos, disorder to my life. Yeah. Man, I could go on this entire podcast about how my how my uh, opinion or my understanding of uh, an approach towards minimalism has changed. Some of the things that stand out is, uh, so for me, minimalism, there there is no destination. You never have the, the perfect amount of stuff. Right. It is a, it is a constant moving target that you have to adjust for as time goes on. And uh, if anything, it's just made me more flexible to, um, to, to towards change. The other thing too is, so, so we've been, I was just uh, listening to this, I forget who wrote it, but it's a book on stoicism. And they're talk, they were talking about how pre post-industrial age, the, um, the message propagated was, there's a God's there's a God shaped hole in your life. Yes. And like, that's what you're missing. You're mm. missing God in your life. And now post industrialization, there is a consumerism shaped hole in our life. Yeah. And, and, and in a lot of ways, the God shaped hole can still, you know, apply to today. So, so I thought minimalism was going to fill this hole. I thought oh. it was going to like not make me complete, but I thought it was going to help me move through life in a way where I didn't feel like I was missing something. Yeah. It would fix the problem. Yeah, so I don't I don't miss anything. I don't feel like I'm missing anything, but there's still a little bit of a of a void there. And what I've learned from this journey over the last 11 12 years is that that void it is so much better to like instead of like you know in a car driving away from that void, it's like I I have it in the passenger seat with me mm. and really understanding that there's nothing that will ever fill that void. There might be a brief instant where, you know, I feel like, Oh, everything's perfect right now. And it, and it's true for that moment, but that void will always come back in some way. So for me, minimalism doesn't fill the void. What it does is it narrows it and it has really helped me accept it. If that may, like I'm friends with the void now. Yeah. In fact, it's made you realize that there isn't a should fill the void. Right. And and I think that's the problem. In fact, we use the word void as though it's pejorative. I was having this great conversation with Danny this week and we were here trying to hang these, these paintings that are behind us that didn't get hung. Um, and so you're in a weird sort of transitional pace, space of the studio right now. But Danny and I were talking about how a lot of these words are used pejoratively. Mm. And, you know, there's a word like um, inferior. Yeah. Like, well, of course, it, it, you look at that and, and we've been programmed to think, oh, that's bad. Right. But like, if you actually want to grow, you want to be inferior to the person you're learning from. Yeah. I was telling Danny, yeah. like, there's nothing I can teach you about audio video stuff now i can guide you through your own growth here mm -hmm. in so many other ways but i'm inferior to danny with right. respect to audio video yeah now it doesn't mean i couldn't change that in the future but in fact if i wanted to learn audio video i love how the caveat is in there of, i could st i could totally not be inferior though if i <laughs> anyway <laughs> well, no, I, what, what i'm saying is yeah. like if i felt compelled to do audio sure. video stuff yes then i'm sure i could get good at it. i'm just not i'm not compelled to do it really yeah, right yeah. but he and jordan are compelled and so what's fascinating is if i wanted to become you know, better, more nuanced, have a deeper understanding of, of the audio video stuff, then I would subordinate myself to Danny because mm -hmm. I, that's how I would learn from him. Absolutely. Being yeah. inferior is actually what you want in that instance. Take that back to the void. I want the void mm -hmm. because what's the opposite? If you go into a giant museum and you're in this cavernous, beautiful room, it's mostly empty. Now we could call that a void, mm -hmm. Or we can call it beauty. Yeah. We can call it acceptance. We can call it space, open space. In fact, when you, uh, when you go to Wyoming or Montana, it's not like, man, when are they going to start building all the condos here? Mm. Like, what, what are you doing with all this uh, space? No, it's like, wow, mm. look at all this open space. Isn't that stunning?
So the void isn't bad, and we've been told that the void is bad, and therefore because it's bad, we need to fill it with things. And when the things don't work, I need to fill it with experiences. When the experiences don't work, I need to fill it with people. When mm. when the people don't work, I need to fill it with creativity. When the creativity doesn't work, I need to fill it with contribution. But maybe the first thing I need to do is know that the void is just wide open space, mm. and it can be beautiful on its own. Did you enjoy this video? If so, you can listen to full episodes of The Minimalist Private Podcast available exclusively on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash the minimalists today. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free.